from Geppetto Studios in New Freedom, Pennsylvania, welcome to the Cosmic Geppetto Podcast, your home for inclusive, positive geek culture, where we talk about movies, comics, music, books, and whatever else we feel like. Please welcome your host. I I very much want you guys to think I'm cool, but I'm not that cool. Brad Mendenhall. any questions? I bet you do. Here, let me guess. Where am I? Why is there duct tape over my mouth? (laughs) No answers for you. I do have a question, though. Does this smell like chloroform? Go to sleep. There you go. Okay, here's a question from me. If you could go back and say five words to your younger self, what would you say? And to what age version of yourself would you go and say them? Well, that got weirder than I thought it was going to be. But, you know, still fun. Uh, thank you, Amy. That is a good question. I think it got the question got cut off a little bit at the end, but I believe the last word you were going to say was it. Um, so, Five words. I would probably go and find a 21-year-old version of me at Lock Haven University when Amy knew me. And the five words would be, just wait, don't do it. And I would know exactly what I was talking about. And it would be really good advice. And one that, uh, (laughs) <laughs> I don't know exactly what I was talking about. There's just a point in my life where I just should have waited, and I shouldn't have done what I did. So uh, that is a great question. Thank you, Amy. Sorry, Katie. unusual feature of this industrial scene, which would not be found in any other country in the world. She steps so softly, there's more to this house that can't be seen. Creaking floors and dim lighting, creaking floors and dim lighting. Climbs up higher, it's hot up there, the air is stale. Violet walls gone gray with dust, violet walls gone gray with dust. I am beyond thrilled, get very lucky where some amazing music comes across my way, and I get a chance to talk with uh, some, some people who just really dig their stuff and this is that time making their cosmic geppetto debut we have owen burton libby whitenauer and eli broxham collectively known as dallas ugly guys how are you doing we're doing great we're doing good thanks for having us so excited to talk to you the music that you make is very cool very different very intimate it is the, the word that just keeps popping into my head where whenever I listen to, when I listen to your music, and I've been, uh, I've just been going over and over the, the songs that have already been released, especially Watch Me Learn, uh, the title track, it just feels like I'm in a room with you guys, such a warmth to your music, and uh, I've just been so impressed, and, and honestly, I could listen to the, all the songs are great, uh, but Watch Me Learn is the one that just gra- grabbed me immediately, and, and I could just listen to that on a loop. Hmm, thank you. That's awesome. Is there a warmth that you're going for? Uh, it, was that intentional? Or was just, you know, is it something that you calculated, or is that just, you, you guys have been making music on and off to, with each other for a while. Um, is that just sort of a natural progression? It's really 
cool to hear you say like those specific words like intimate and warm because I actually was just writing like a little quote for something today about kind of the sound we were going for with the album and I used both of those words that is something that we were very consciously going for pretty much every stage of the process we were like we want this to be like warmth was a word we were using a lot much to like the chagrin of our <laughs> producer and mixing engineer who were like what does that mean like that's not a useful descriptor we were like we just want it to be warm <laughs> but they got there because they're awesome um and then we also did go for sort of like an intimate sound because the vibe of the the music and the album, as we've said a few times, like in our, I think in our, our bio probably says this, but we we're going for this idea of like the experience of like catching up with your friends and like telling each other stories and like stuff you'd been going through the last few years. Cause the three of us made this album after a period of not uh, living in the same place for a few years. So yeah, that's pretty much hits the nail on the head in terms of what we were going for. And it's funny that you say that because what, what struck me is these musics almost feel like a conversation you have a few years out of college when you are in a room or in a bar with your best college friends who you haven't spoken with for a little while. And you still have the shared language and the shared in-jokes finding out, but you're getting caught up and also sometimes a little surprised with the directions everyone's lives are going. So it's, it's that in-between point where you're no longer in college, people aren't quite married, or if they're married, they're not having kids yet. So things can go in sort of strange directions. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'll let Owen kind of pick this up because he had the most wild card experience of the three of us. But that is exactly what happened because we were we had been out of school for... We just graduated college when we when we went our separate ways. I moved to New York. Owen worked in Wisconsin for a while and then moved to um, Senegal. I basically didn't talk to Owen. I talked to him like twice via Facebook Messenger the whole time that he was overseas. Um, so when he came back, like we all had a lot to talk about. But yeah, that was basically what this album was. I think I would say Owen had the most interesting stories. Yeah, Owen, you were in, uh, with the Peace Corps. Is that right? Yeah, I, I was in Peace Corps Senegal from 2018 to 2020. Good gracious. Really making me feel bad about you know, just podcasting and not making the world any better. So, uh, so there's that. I'm not sure we were always doing that either. <laughs> Trying to anyways. And while you were doing that and doing really important work, what was music to you then? Were you able to make music or really or absorb it in your brain where you start collecting stories that you eventually want to put to music? I did have a guitar with me. I actually ended up taking the first guitar I ever played when I was a little kid was my dad's beater Yamaha Dreadnought that was like laminate from the late 70s. Not a special instrument at all. But the real beauty of that guitar is that it's built like a tank and, you know, always lived in a basement and never had a case or anything. So when I needed something to bump around West Africa with, that was kind of the, the choice. So I had that old guitar with me. Senegal, there's, there's music going on all the time, but it's just like a totally different musical culture. Because it's like all in oral history, it, it can be hard to... It can be hard to like try to participate in that as a musician, or at least from a musician of my background, because their music is mostly drumming and singing. And there's all kinds of like cultural cues for who is even allowed to do the drumming or the singing, depending on the ceremony. So although I was always kind of like immersed in that music, I was never I never really found a way to like get on the path of of participating in it as a musician myself so the music that I was making while I was abroad was mostly just songwriting which was a pretty like solitary pursuit but it was a good way to pass the time there wasn't always a lot going on and it was a good thing to do with a good place to put your homesickness so to speak and then I did have a friend there who was also serving in the Peace Corps who was a great singer for a period of time I was really focused on uh 
writing music to to uh, like sing duets between her and I. How long did it take when you came back to the States before the three of you sort of got to sit down and realize it was a good idea to start making music again? <laughs> so little time that Owen lost a bunch of money <laughs> because he couldn't, he basically got out of the Peace Corps early to like do a small little like reunion tour. And then two weeks later, everyone got evacuated and everyone who got evacuated because of the pandemic, because of the pandemic. Yeah. Right. And everyone who got evacuated got this, like, I don't, I don't what extra emergency stipend or something. Oh, and like snuck out and then, you know, was kind of left high and dry by the pandemic immediately is, is the answer to that question. Well, it wasn't it worth it, Owen? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but um, I, I was kind of the one who, while Owen was away, kind of was keeping the keeping the dream alive in terms of the band getting back together. It was only my dream for those two years. But I just kind of missed playing music with Libby and Owen. And Owen had been sending me some of the songs that he was writing. Um, and I'd sent a couple to Libby that she really liked too. And so we kind of just had this like no pressure song share that was kind of like after Owen's coming, uh, coming home party where we just played a bunch of songs for each other. And we're like, wow, we really, really like what we've all been up to in the last two years. Like these are, these are some good songs. And what was it in 2012 you met in college? Is my memory right on that? 2012 was when we went into college. Is that what I said? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 2012 is when we is when we met. Yeah. What drew the three of you together musically? Because what I've heard of from Dallas Ugly, it's not like your music sounds like anything else. You, you definitely have a lot of pieces that you, you hear, and the, the, but the way you mix the violin and electric guitar and this nice languid pace, what sort of brought the connection where you, you have something that's a little off the beaten path, you two, the three of you sort of were able to connect and, and make something sort of different. It's, it's not like, it's not like you're a four piece cover band at a local bar. You, you know how that happens, but this is very different from what there doesn't seem like a natural progression for this. It, it, it seems like very, something very special. At the foundation. So we like started jamming together and playing together. Yeah. When we first met in college and That came from a place of just like the three of us were pretty deep in like our classical, like conservatory music school experience. The three of us were like, man, we'd really love to like play some other music besides just like orchestral music. Like that would be fun. And I think through that like shared curiosity, we just kind of like made it work. And we were mostly at that time playing like sort of if you're familiar with like goat rodeo sessions like things inspired by like sort of like arranged acoustic music was more what we were doing then I was sort of like a brute force thing which I think is why we have a a unique sound together because we were just trying to like make the skills that we had work and then like when we went up went our separate ways and like had different musical lives etc and came back together we were more informed musicians but we still had that spirit of like basically like how do we use each each other's individual strengths to create a sound so it's not now it's like a bit more straightforward like we're songwriting we're not writing these like instrumental things anymore it still has that spirit of just like not forcing anyone to be something they're not. It's like, if you play something a certain way, like Owen has like his unique guitar style. I have the way I play fiddle, et cetera. It's like, there's no need to like fit into something that already exists. Like, let's just make the most of our individual strengths, sort of. It's so strange. I don't know where to place the blame. These thoughts of you, they come and go as they please And it's not fair Didn't realize that I ever even cared When you come around, some part of me wanted you to go And it ain't right When I I go to where you are 
there's no use in trying I never really saw you that way I just keep you on my mind To liven up my day Though I love holding the reins I still hate knowing what comes next Baby, you're just part of the songs on here for watch me learn how, how much of it is things that were that owen you, you worked on while while you were overseas or while you were um in the peace corps or and how much or how much of this is new music that the three of you got together and created fresh at least a handful of these i wrote while i was in senegal there's a few that were written in the time after we reunited. Kind of a good cue on the album for like, who who is like the lyricist behind the song is whoever wrote the lyrics is always singing lead. So that's kind of why we trade off singing lead on the whole album. And then, you know, usually the, the way that like the songwriting process works for us is that we come to the group with a mostly flushed out something that has verses and choruses and chords and then as an ensemble we'll arrange it work up vocal harmonies but then also even make kind of more structural decisions about like how many choruses there should even be or like tell the writer to go back to the drawing board on a bridge occasionally changing chords most of these songs I think the majority of them were written or at least conceived of before we reunited and then when we reunited we like kind of all collectively breathe new life into them that was something i was going to ask about because there is the handoff of vocal duties i love that and not a lot of bands do that very well uh especially because bands tend to like land on the sound and also land on a front man and you don't see too many that groups that you know have the confidence or have the the multiple people with the ability to sing oh and you and libby have very obviously not just different voices but you know just sort of different styles one thing that i really enjoyed that, that both of you do is neither of you seem to be screamers <laughs> i've always liked singers who don't feel the need to belt like you said you you, you do want to have that in, intimacy and it's often when you have the screaming singers that puts a block between the performer and the the audience often. I know it's supposed to be raw emotion, but for me, it, it often feels so forced. And I'm thinking of Elliot Smith, who never screamed when he sang and would have the most intense and very easy to connect with singer. So I, I love that all the singing is, is different and you, you have your individual styles, but are very much in service of the song and telling the story and selling the lyrics without reaching down and seeing how loud you can yell. I would say that's like kind of goes back to the thing I was saying about just in general, the way we, we operate as a band is to, again, like not ask anyone to be something they're not. The three of us, part of that is we all happen to be like gentle singers. And honestly, some of that's like, comes from a place of limitation like not in like a self-deprecating way but like none of us are trained singers so the way we sing I think we're all like trying to improve but like the way we sing is the way we sing you know what I mean and so like we're just like okay well like none of us are like belters so let's lean into that and make that part of the sound rather than like fight it just because that's a thing that people do is sing full voiced. Yeah. I think just like, there's a lot of like leaning into limitations <laughs> that happens in our music, which yeah, is right. like, I always, I always enjoy what like can come out of that. So yeah, I think, I think that's probably where that's coming from. So many performers and often it's because they're trying to chase trends, try to become something they aren't. And it always feels forced and it never feels real and so many really great talented musicians and performers over the years have done it you know there was no reason why the rolling stones should have done disco stuff 
<laughs> it feels very genuine what you're doing because it, it's obviously you're not chasing trends or you didn't hear what was really catching on on the radio and you know try to do your own version of bts uh-huh. <laughs> my son's really my i have a 10 year old and i'm hearing a lot of bts right now so that's- <laughs> I mean, they're great. Yeah. It's just not who we are. We, we, <laughs> I am not taking a shot at any at them or any other K-pop pr- practitioners. But uh, <laughs> speaking of BTS, uh, no. Um, is there something that you guys listen to that could even be an influence uh, that would surprise someone? I'll go through phases where like R and B is the primary music I'm listening to, and I'm kind of in that phase right now. Um. But also I feel like, although it maybe doesn't come across in exactly the way I play, I feel like a feature, at least of modern R&B, is that it's actually like quite guitar driven. So I think, I don't know, you can kind of trace the thread that way. But yeah, that might be a surprise to some people. Well, there's some rhythms in your music because it's not, it it doesn't feel like basic 4-4. It's the rhythms are sort of complex and I could see that being an R&B influence. Yeah, that's actually never occurred to me, but that that definitely could be. What what's uh what's the R&B album that you're really listening to lately? Amber Mark's new album. Oh gosh, what is the title of that album? I I'm blanking on the name of it, but it came out uh, last month, but that has been what I'm spinning most of all. And I'm Amber Mark, I'm a huge fan. She's probably my favorite. Tayana Taylor, that kind of see I know there's like a million subgenres of R&B. And I don't know how to describe <laughs> that specific subgenre because there's a lot of stuff that doesn't click with me. But those two artists and the ones that are kind of on the periphery of that area, uh, yeah, I'm really into that stuff. I think that's three dimensions deep. Yeah, that's it. You're exactly right. Three dimensions deep. I don't want to act like I have this all like some sort of catalog in the back of my head where I am up on date. I look that up. <laughs> I very much want you guys to think I'm cool, but I'm not that cool. So uh, We aren't cool either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the cameras are off. I mean, we think you're cool. But like. All right, very good. You you have some live performances on your website. I love the way you guys perform. And again, it goes back to the intimacy. You know, there's no backup dancers. There's no flashy choreography. Libby isn't on a giant spring uh, flying through the air or anything like that. There is this wonderful interplay and competence and sincerity to the performance. And I love asking musicians this. Do you guys see yourself as a studio group or do you see yourself as live performers? Hmm. I think that's interesting. I, I guess as performers, we haven't had a chance to perform a ton with this band but I think like the performing we have done recently like has been really satisfying I work primarily as like a fiddle player slash violinist so like I'm definitely more of a performer than a recording artist that being said I think like in the future we'd all love to dig in in more into like sort of the lack of limitations you have in the studio, like creating weird sounds and like layering things. But this, the album that we just made is definitely pretty close to our live performance when we have like the full band going. Like it's not, there's not like a bunch of like pyrotechnics on it. There's some like extra stuff that's on there that Alec put on like some synths and stuff. But I would say currently we're like live performers primarily. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we all kind of come from, we met as in uh, getting our classical degrees, and then we all kind of fell in love with folk music in in different ways. And so those are like, you can record both those genres, but you're kind of missing the point or something. Yeah, it's like primarily a live experience. Yeah, like both of those genres are exactly very live experience. And then, you know, speaking of cover bands, like (laughs) Owen and I in high school grew up playing in rock and roll cover bands so also a live thing because you're playing somebody else's tunes mine was not a cover band we made original music but it was rock music. <laughs> <laughs> so did we but, <laughs> but you know we still played uh white room by cream <laughs> I, I was just gonna ask eli what was your go-to uh cover song so, so white room wow that is uh my brother and i had 
a lot of energy in the band. He played drums, but we were not the best musicians in that band. Uh, we had uh, a guitarist who outclassed us in terms of his musicianship. And so we just did basically whatever he wanted to do, which was like Stevie Ray Vaughan stuff um, and Jimi Hendrix. So that was, yeah, we did a lot of Stevie Ray Vaughan covers, <laughs> a lot of Jimi Hendrix covers. What was your favorite Hendrix song to cover? I mean, we did Voodoo Child. That was that was a good one. <laughs> that one typically lasted a good 10 minutes. <laughs> And the audience of like two people was like just in a conversation with between themselves. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was just for us. <laughs> all the recording during the pandemic um how, how did that sort of inform the recording and did it sort of did it in one way did it help because let's face it there's not a whole lot to do especially at the beginning part of the pandemic there wasn't a whole lot to do um there's gonna be there's been a lot of pretty cool albums that have come out over the last few years from musicians who just quite frankly weren't able to tour or do anything else and they did their cover album or they sort of did their intimate I'm playing this by myself album and stuff like that. How did the pandemic, how did the pandemic sort of inform your recording process? Yeah, I think, well, so in some ways I feel like this is like kind of a classic pandemic album. And I think in like two very important ways, it's, it like kind of bucks certain trends. And, and those ways specifically are that like, there's not really any songs that are like, it's not like about the pandemic, if that makes sense. Like mainly these songs were written before. So um, it's more of about just a certain time in your lives. And then the other way it's, it's kind of like, doesn't fall in line with other pandemic albums is that we like made a point to go to a studio and all be in the same room. And like, you know, we just, we actually were, we had just got the first or just got been fully vaccinated by the time we were there. But um, you know, we took all the necessary precautions to like track it together. Um, so that, you know, it wasn't like a distanced album, but I think like what it really offered us was we lived together for almost a year before we recorded it. Um, and we hadn't like, with not like we were very careful. So it was literally, it was just, us. it was just us. We yeah. like, didn't see anyone for that year besides like us and our other roommate. Yeah. So we had this like kind of intense collaboration time which pretty well like tracked and mapped to the kind of intense collaboration that we had in college um so that was kind of like it was kind of a wild experience you know once we knew we were going to make the record we were rehearsing and like writing every, every single day and we were making these um kind of like involved demos of everything um so in that sense yeah it couldn't have happened without <laughs> without the pandemic just giving us a ton of time and also the studio i'm pretty sure is often that we recorded in is often booked and so we probably wouldn't have been able to get access to that if it wasn't the pandemic um well also i'd say like in the studio um that was pretty influenced by the pandemic situation too because before we knew we were going to have the vaccine we were like okay what's the safest way we can do that and we determined that it was to basically like all live on the premise for the two weeks we were recording like the engineer it's like the the recording studio is also someone's like home so it was going to be like they were going to be there and isolating um our drummer our producer the three of us it was like we were all going to be like all in for those two weeks um just to eliminate like covid risk basically and we despite the fact that we'd all just been fully vaccinated, we just stuck to that plan because it was still early. And that probably influenced the music quite a bit too, to just be like in this working space together for two weeks. When, and I'm, I'm so curious about this because 
it, you you bring a drummer in uh, and you had uh, one or two other any other musicians that you bring in. How difficult is that, or what is the sort of the process of that of finding the right drummer to share your music and help bring that part of um, the music to life? Because some great drum work on the album. Is it tough to find someone who's got to be really be a very close part of the process, but they're but they're not part of the band. So there's, I imagine there's a different dynamic in that regard. The way that that ended up working was Alec, our producer sort of gave us a list of drummers that he likes working with. And we went through and picked the best fit um, of that list and ended up with the person who's drumming on our album, Jason Berger, who is amazing Like Eli said, one of the things we did when we were all isolated together is we made these really like intricate demos that were like, they were mixed, honestly, for what they were pretty well, but like they were not professional enough to be the album, but one could have just put out those recordings. Like we, we really like went in on them. Um, And so we sent those to the drummer and we're basically just like, do whatever seems right. Um, On top of that, Alec made these beats like he made these really cool like synth beats to go along with um every track to sort of guide Jason's hand a little bit I think the combination of those two things we basically like got in the studio and just I don't even think we rehearsed we might have rehearsed a couple things but we literally just started recording like it was pretty amazing Jason just like started playing we're like oh there it is cool that sounds great so that's how the the drumming process worked it was really cool to see that come together. In my opinion, we we super super lucked out with Jason. I mean, yeah, he, he like his ideas just really really clicked, and it seemed when we got there, he was super excited about the demos and all the songs, and I think that gave us confidence. And then it was clear that he like had really listened to them and like understood them in in some important way. And so I think we had a lot of trust for him and you know, he trusted the songs and, and it just, it just kind of worked out perfectly. Uh, oh, one thing I, I sort of want to ask you with a song that you created, was there a particular time where uh, you, you create the song, you had it in your head and during the recording process, something is added by someone, be it the drummers or bass work or Libby has these amazing fiddle fills. Was there something that somebody added to it and you remember going, oh, wow, that's great. Uh, you know, something really cool that sort of made, added something that you really liked to, to your music. Yeah, when we did Liberated No Ones, it's a, it's a single out, so you may have heard this one too if, when you were listening to us. It's maybe like aesthetically kind of vague. It doesn't point very cleanly to a specific style. And it's also pretty slow and has limited chords and stuff and it, it's just kind of a good blank slate I felt like to do a lot of bolder production decisions but I didn't know what those decisions were going to be until we were in the studio and as we you know Alec was just throwing stuff on it and we were kind of like let's go back and add some stuff and just add a bunch of stuff and then we'll figure out what we want to take away in post more or less at some point our uh engineer Adrian was like Jason before we wrap this up you should go in there and just like put like a a drum and bass like blast beat at the end of the chorus and we'll see what that sounds like. And he went in there and did that. And we like crunched it through a filter. And I was like, it like took the whole song to like a level that I had never conceived of for it. So that was something I ended up being really excited about was, and it, it's funny, that was kind of like the only, maybe the only time Adrian from the engineer's perspective, it was the only time Adrian from the engineering seat decided to like step out and be like, let me give you guys just like one musical or production pointer to try out. And it was just like pure gold. (laughs) So that was, that one was really cool. That that's what makes sort of the musical collaboration process. So cool is you can be surprised. I I, I play a little bit of music. Uh, Some buddies in, it wasn't that long ago. My friends were over, we were playing some music and we have an amazing drummer he just did a fill that he had never done before. I actually stopped and looked at him. I was like, well, that, that was really great. Please, please do that a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice that you can be surprised. And it, it's part of being part of a collaborative process and also having trust in, 
you having trusted that they're going to do something cool and them having the trust faith that if they try something and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but they feel comfortable sort of taking those swings it says a lot that you were created an environment where that was encouraged. Yeah. I'd say that's like a big part of how we work just in general is like, we just, it's sort of like nothing is off limits. And then if it's stupid, we'll be like, well, that was dumb. (laughs) But we like definitely, no matter who we're working with, try to give people a lot of space to like try their, their thing. I mean, I totally, I totally agree. Like I, I prefer collaborative projects. Like I don't think I have much interest in like solo work because I just love those moments when people add stuff. Yeah. And it just like creates another, a whole other thing you like couldn't have probably come up with in your own brain. That's like the cool part about it. Kind of a perfect example of that is what our producer, Alex Spiegelman did throughout. There's so many examples, but before when we were just like talking and conceiving of the album, he was talking about other albums he's produced. And, and one that we all love is by Anna Eggy called, is it the kiss? And he was talking, he was like on that one, we tracked everything. And then I kind of went in with like weirdness and she told me where, where the weirdness should end. And it was, he was like, it was kind of a low level of weirdness for that album. Which is an amazing album. So like the no, album's incredible. no shade either way. No, I mean, it was just, yeah, yeah. It, it was like, well, it was right for that album and it was perfect. Yeah. And then we're like, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll let you know when it gets too weird. It never got too yeah, weird. Yeah, you're like, just <laughs> it was, going. But, 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 you know, everything he added was so, like, so tasteful and musical and, and just, just like exactly what, what the songs needed. For example, one you haven't heard yet, it's the last song on the album, he added this cool vocoder part as like almost a duetting instrument to Libby's vocals. And it just like, I don't know, it elevated the song in such a cool way. No, no record scratches just to have the sake of record scratches partway through a song. (laughs) Yes. Right. So be weird as long as the weird feels right for what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. It's all filtered through the, you know, somebody who we, who we sort of deeply trust and I, whose musical instincts are are kind of impeccable. (laughs) Right. Weird, weird for Alec is, is like tasteful. (laughs) So I got to ask real quick. Dallas Ugly, what does that mean? Where, where does that uh, name come from? Um, so the name comes from the three of us met in Chicago. We all live together in Nashville now. None of us have ever lived in Dallas. I would say we have very little connection to Dallas, if any, except for where the story comes from, which was as we uh, started recording those like demos or what Libby was describing as like maybe a little bit more produced than what a demo typically is. We kind of had some of those ready or almost ready. And we wanted to start like sending them out to people and seeing about talking to Alec and everything. So we really needed a name to send this stuff along with. It can be so lame to like have to send people music and be like, we don't have a name yet, but we're working on it. We actually just ended up putting a date on the calendar and like gave ourselves a deadline of like, no matter what, we're going to have a name by this date. It really just became a, a theme of our household. Every clause that was said, someone else would have to say, is that our band name? Is that our band name? You know, it's like everything was on the table. Just try and consider anything that came up, if that was by chance a good band name. Of course, basically none of them were because good band names are very hard to come by. And then when our deadline actually came i was catching up with a friend of mine who lives back in chicago and he was telling me about this hinge date he had just gone on with a woman who had just moved from dallas to chicago early on in the date she (laughs) makes a point of telling him she's like hinge kind of sucks here because In Dallas, everyone on Hinge is super hot. And in Chicago, everyone on Hinge is pretty ugly. But you're okay, so that's why I'm here. It, like, really shocked him because that's such a bold thing to say in the first 10 minutes of a first date. (laughs) But he ended up, like, sticking it out the rest of the date. And anyways, he was relaying this story to me. And then after I got off the phone, I was, like, talking to Eli and Libby about that. 
and they're just like and you know and so eli was like so that means your friend adam is dallas okay but chicago hot and then we're like no i think it means he's dallas ugly but chicago okay and then we were like well i guess that's what we are too (laughs) because we're all you know from chicago and then we were like oh dallas ugly that's actually an awesome band name and so that's kind of how it came about that is a good band name it can it's catchy it's just the right amount of syllables it's like provocative but not so provocative that you can't see past it or something like at least i hope that's the case (laughs) You know, and it shortens the D-U real well. Perfect. That's a good name. Oh, thank you. Yeah, band, good band names. Nearly impossible to come by. You have to be able to say them without cringing, which is what, that was our that was our one criterion for this band name. <laughs> be able to say it without cringing. Or apologizing. Or apologizing. <laughs> same, same, yeah, concept. What's next for Dallas Ugly? People are starting to go back on the road. Are, are you planning out a tour? I know you have a couple of dates on, on your uh, on your website. Is the goal to do more touring or is the goal to right away get, start making more music? Our favorite thing to do, I think, I speak for all three of us as musicians, is to arrange music. Like, we just, like, love to do that together. We are, like, already, like, working on new songs and stuff. We've had these ones for quite a while. So we're working on some new music just, like, at home we're not there's no like current plans to go to the studio but i think like primarily yeah we played we just did a week a a little week run in the midwest and i think like for us especially after the pandemic and spending so much time just like working on music in private we're like really rearing to get on the road and play for people so i think that's our our primary goal is to get some tours booked. Um, We're working on some stuff in July in the Northeast and like late August and sort of the Midwest. If people are around there, look out for that stuff. But um, yeah, I think like we're really excited about just performing this stuff for people. Like that's the number one goal right now is to get out there. I'm looking forward to, uh, I I live in the Northeast. So uh, if you come up, I'll definitely, uh, be, be sure to catch you. Uh, recommend everyone uh, check out Watch Me Learn. Where can people keep track of you and make sure that they grab the album and keep tabs of when you're going to come to their town? DallasLikely.com is our website. You can find links from there to all of our social media accounts. You know, or we're just Dallas Ugly on Instagram and, and Facebook or Dallas Ugly Band, perhaps, on something the nice thing about dallas ugly it's not like there's a whole lot of people using that you you guys really have cornered the market it, it's good because it, it makes sense and it's a real words but it's not, there aren't a bunch of dallas uglies out there it's true it's true yeah no you pretty much you know type that into your google search bar and you will find our three faces staring back at you awesome guys well this has been amazing i appreciate so much that you've taken the time uh will you guys come back yeah, we'd love to. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having us, Brad. Haven't slept well in weeks. have made peace with the fact that I'm leaving you again. It's hard enough out there, even knowing you still care. And take my call in the middle of the night. That wraps episode 259. Big thanks to Dallas Ugly. They could not have been nicer, and we're incredibly generous with their time. Be sure to listen to Watch Me Learn wherever quality music can be found. Also, big thanks to Amy Kenrup. She is a lifelong friend, and I love her to pieces. Next time on the Cosmic Geppetto Podcast, speaking of lifelong friends... Jarf is back to talk what is new and cool on streaming services. Till then, as Jarf likes to say, See you in the funny pages. It's knowing that I don't know how to stay. A feeling I know too well. Where I never fail. Deep enough in love. Subscribe to the Cosmic Geppetto Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever quality podcasts can be found. 
rate and review us while there. Follow us on Twitter at Cosmic G-Pod and we will follow you back. Unless you're a jerk, we don't follow jerks. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cosmic Geppetto. We love hearing your ideas for upcoming episodes. Email us at Cosmic Geppetto at Comcast.net. Well, that, that was really great. Please, please do that a lot more. Can you?